Good morning. It's a great joy to warmly welcome each one of you to this service of worship here at the Basking Ridge Presbyterian Church. If you'd like to find out more about our life and ministry, more about the opportunities to be blessed or to be a blessing, even in the week ahead, I invite you to check out our website at brpc.org and to please phone the church office or reach out to any member of the staff team if we can be of support to you in any way at all. And now as we continue to draw near to God's presence in this place, join with me in our responsive call to worship. We are God's household, crafted by the architect of creation. Our hearts a shelter for the outcast, our hands open to the stranger. We are God's people, created in the divine image, to tell others of God's love, to offer mercy as freely as we have received it. We are God's children, called to give of ourselves, chosen to serve the lost and lonely, gifted to minister to a hurting world. come into God's presence rejoicing, rejoicing that God has made us, called us, that God loves us, rejoicing that we can come in humility and truth before God and confess our sins and trust in God's goodness and in God's mercy. So let us come now to a time of confession as we come before God, acknowledging the ways that we have failed both God and one another. Let us pray together. God of compassion, you asked for my hands that you might use them for your purposes. I gave them for a moment, then withdrew them for the work was hard. You asked for my mouth to speak out against injustice. I gave you a whisper that I might not be accused. You asked for my eyes to see the pain of poverty. I closed them for I did not want to see. You asked for my life, that you might work through me. I gave a small part, that I might not get too involved. 
Lord, forgive my calculated efforts to serve you only when it is convenient for me to do so, only in those places where it is safe to do so, and only with those who make it easy to do so. Inspire and empower me to better witness to your deep and abiding love. Amen. Friends, be assured this day that God hears and answers our prayers, that God knows our hearts, he knows the faults and failings, but he also knows the deep desires, he knows the intentions of our hearts. And so know this day as we come in humility and truth to confess that God answers with grace and with mercy. And so through Jesus Christ, through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection, know that your sins are indeed forgiven. Amen. Friends, as we have received the peace of Christ into our hearts and homes, I invite you to take a moment to share that peace with one another. You can share that peace with those who are worshiping with you, or take a moment to send a text or an email to family and friends further afield. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sunday. How can we show God that we love him? There must be so many ways. Many years ago, there was a king named Solomon, and he decided to build a beautiful temple to show God how much he loved him. And ever since then, people have been building beautiful churches to show God that they love him. But not everyone can build God a beautiful church. Most of us don't have enough money or the skills to build a church. To build a beautiful church, it costs a lot of money and requires skills to work with wood and stone and paint, among many other things. And it would take millions of dollars to build a beautiful church. Do any of you have a million dollars? Well, no, most of us will never have as, that much money to spare alone, but we can work together with others giving what we can. And sometimes, working together with lots of other people, we can do much more than we could do all by ourselves. There is a saying that I really love, and it's, many hands makes light work. And what does that phrase mean? It means that when we work together, we can do much more and have an easier time than if we worked alone. And there are many other ways in which we can show God that we love him. Can you think of any? One way is to show God uh, that we love him by coming to church and worshiping each week and going to Sunday school and reading our Bible and singing our hymns. All those things are showing God that we love him. We can also show God we love him by obeying him and to live our life the way he would want us to. And we can ask ourselves, 
What would Jesus do? And base our decisions on that important question. Another way is by praying. By praying and keeping in touch with God, each and every day we're showing him that we love him. So let's pray together now. Dear God, we thank you for your love. Help us to praise you and show you our love each day. In your name we pray, and all God's children say, Amen. Good morning. My name is David Fahey. My wife, Allison, and I joined Basking Ridge Presbyterian Church in 2015. Our three children, Finnegan, Winifred, and Eamon, were all baptized in this church. Because of this, my family will forever be rooted in this church. Though I feared that our recent time away from the church spent over much of the last two years, might test the strength of those roots. As I look back now upon this period, I realize, and thank God, that it has done much the opposite. Our family gathered together on Sunday mornings, maybe like yours, in pajamas, with pancakes, to participate in online services. My mother, a devout Roman Catholic, oftentimes joined in our services from the safety of her own living room after, of course, she attended online services at her home parish. During a year or so of being unable to be with me and my family in person, that moment, that moment of sharing a laugh together over a joke in one of Dennis's sermons, or being able to recount a lesson together, from one of Miss Stacy's children's messages, became a reliable point of conversation and connectivity for us, for her, for our family. Having lived through the challenges of the last two years, the darkness of the last two years, and having been guided by Basking Ridge Presbyterian Church, my trust in God has deepened and my faith has grown. Over the next several weeks, 
you'll hear that phrase repeatedly. You'll hear from members of our church, representatives of our mission partners, from Dennis, from Maureen, and from others, about the profound impact that Baskin Ridge Presbyterian Church has had on them during the pandemic. We are eager for you to be able to hear about these amazing blessings. We ask that in reflection, you take the time to consider not only what our church has done for them, but what it's done for you, your family, and your faith. In the lead up to Consecration Sunday, we also ask that you prayerfully consider your ability to make a personally meaningful financial contribution to the church. As an expression of how your trust in God has deepened and your faith has grown, we ask you to reinvest in Basking Ridge Presbyterian Church so that our work can continue to be as deep, profound, and impactful in a time of light as it has been in a recent time of darkness. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the first book of Kings. Now King Hiram of Tyre sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always been a friend to David. Solomon sent his word to Hiram saying, you know that my father David cannot build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. So I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord said to my father David, your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, shall build the house for my name. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral houses of the Israelites, before King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. All the people of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the festival in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests carried the Ark. So they brought up the Ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent, the priests and the Levites brought them up. King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel, who had assembled before him, were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place, in the inner sanctuary of the house, and in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark, so that the cherubim made a covering above the ark and its poles. The poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside. They are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses had placed there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites when they came out of the land of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have built for you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, by your grace and mercy, may these words I'm about to speak point back to your word just read and to the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ. For it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Some years ago, there was a youth minister who served here at our church. And one Sunday night, during a gathering of one of the youth groups, he led the youth in playing a game in the sanctuary where they crawled under the pews. They called it pew races. They split into two teams and began in the back of the sanctuary and crawling on their bellies as fast as they could, had a race to see who could get to the front first. Now, I love doing fun things with youth. It's important to help them discover that the life of faith 
is meant to be joyful, not dry and boring. I was a youth minister once too, including right here for six years as an associate pastor. Some of the most enjoyable years of my ministry were as a youth minister. But when I heard about those pew races, it made me uncomfortable and unhappy that he'd done that. I sought him out in private and I said, the sanctuary is a holy place. It's where we gather to commune with God. It's where we gather for worship on Sunday morning. It's where we celebrate baptisms at the start of life and memorial services at the end of life. It is to be treated with respect, with reverence. Please don't hold additional pew races in our sanctuary. To which he responded, well, aren't all portions of creation just as holy to God? Isn't that what we learned in seminary? A sanctuary is no more holy than anywhere else. We continued talking about it for a few minutes. Our conversation did not end particularly well. We never came to agreement. Theologically, I agreed with him. All ground is holy ground in the eyes of God. Every life, every place is sacred. Yet as pastor of this congregation that I love, as someone who has had countless encounters with Almighty God in this sacred space, pastorally, I still felt uncomfortable with what he had done. The conversation that I had with that youth minister years ago, it begs the question, is the sanctuary of a church more holy, more of a gateway to God, a place to have a transformative encounter with the presence of God than anywhere else. Say the youth center or the golf course or a trail out in the woods. Is there something unique about a place set aside for the worship of God? Do we encounter God differently in that kind of location? King Solomon, who was a central character in this morning's passage, he was especially well known for his wisdom. He wisely settled a famous dispute about motherhood between two women. Tradition attributes three books of the Bible to him, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. But more important than his wisdom or his great wealth was God's call upon Solomon to build the temple. It was his life's work to build a sacred and glorious structure to hold the symbol of God's covenant with the people of Israel, the two stone tablets that contained the Ten Commandments, a place where the people of God could gather and have transformative encounters with the presence of God. The temple held deep meaning for the Israelite community. It was built on Mount Moriah, where, had it not been for God's intervention, Abraham would have sacrificed his son, Isaac. It was built on land where, despite circumstances with death on the horizon, life prevailed. The temple was a seven-year project built with cedar and fir. Rich furnishings and decorations were made of the finest materials. Artistic and architectural excellence made the temple something to behold. And the inaugural worship service dedicating the temple matched the magnificence of the building itself. An eight-day celebration marked its completion. I've heard of long church services, but eight days? A joyful occasion filled with glorious music, lots of instruments, countless singers. An offering of 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep was so large that extra space was required for the offerings. Solomon's speech and prayers of dedication are some of the most inspiring passages in all of scripture. Yet Solomon also makes it clear that Almighty God is not limited by or contained in some way by the four walls 
of that sacred space. He says, if heaven, even the highest heaven, can't contain you, how can this temple that I've built contain you? The temple was not about containing God, it was about giving access to God, to God's people. The story raises profound theological questions. In what ways do our buildings and campus facilitate access to God? I'm not saying they exist to contain God, nor to be a gateway to heaven. The question is, how do they help people connect with God? And where does God live? And what is special about a church? Is there something about a church sanctuary that is more holy than other places? And who is it that is meant to be welcomed here? Solomon says that people will come from a distant country because of your reputation, because they will hear of your great reputation, your great power, and your outstretched arm. People will come, he's saying, from distant countries, countless other cultures, to worship God, to have an encounter with God. And the people are to be welcomed. They are to experience God's outstretched arm. It raises the question, how do we treat immigrants? How do we do that as a nation and here closer to home? How do we respond to new people in town, new people in church, or even new ideas, new perspectives? The investment of new technology in our sanctuary, and I'm excited for us to soon begin using it. It has a single purpose, help us have encounters with God. Whether you are at home and part of our online community or here in person, it's that simple with God's love, his call upon our lives, a fuller understanding of those whom God calls us to minister to and serve. It's here to help us have encounters with God. We pour significant resources every year into caring for this house of worship, this dwelling place for the Spirit of God. This place where young and old, newcomers and folks who've been here for generations meet God. And it's not that God is boxed in in this place. God is not contained within this place. What I'm saying instead is that this is holy ground where we seek God's presence. It's a place for us to turn to collectively, whether we are here in person or connecting online. Last Sunday morning, a 65-year-old minister who had been our seminarian 40 years ago was in the area to spend a few days at Princeton Seminary. While a student there, he did a year of field education here at our church 40 years ago, serving alongside the pastors every Sunday. Well, in the church where he serves, he recently announced his retirement, and while in Princeton, he wanted to return to this place to worship God, to connect with this community of faith. He, he wanted to return to the sanctuary where he preached one of his own first sermons and heard so many other prayers and messages and words of faith that helped shape his sense of calling and identity, this place where he sensed the Spirit of God. And what a joy it was to welcome him back to be our PC. And following the worship service, I was so glad to reconnect with two members of the Ridge High class of 1985 who were in town for a belated 35th high school reunion. They both grew up in our church. They were bo both Boy Scouts down in Calvin Hall. They were raised in our Sunday school, went on our main work camps and were nurtured in the faith here in so many ways. And they both live out of state now, and they were back in town, and they came back. They came home to join with us in worship, to feel the spirit of God's presence, to join with us in lifting our voices in prayer and in praise here in this place. A physical representation of God's presence with his people. That was the purpose of the temple in the days of the Old Testament. And it's the purpose of a physical church in our day. God is present 
everywhere, the psalmist says. Where can I go from your presence? I can't go anywhere, for God is everywhere. Yet in our scripture, God promises to be present in the temple, the sanctuary, in a way that is tangible. In the waters of baptism, in the breaking of the bread, the pouring of the cup. In the people of God gathered in this place together, offering their prayers and their hymns of praise unto God. God is particularly and powerfully present. And the heartbeat of the temple and the story is not some statue or painting of God. It is not some man or woman made image of God. It is the word of God, that word which reflects the covenant promise between God and God's people. We are in a strange in-between time right now, a liminal space. More and more people are being blessed by returning to in-person worship and other ministry gatherings that are happening in person. Yet many also still prefer the comfort and increased confidence of worshiping and engaging from home. Both options equally important, equally meaningful. It will be fascinating to see what it all will look like a year from now, five years from now. We don't yet know. What we do know is that this sanctuary is a dwelling place for the presence of God. What we do know is that God invites us to meet him here in person or through the wonders of technology to have a transformative encounter with God. May we continue to come and may we invite countless others, wherever they come from, wherever their story or situation, to join us. Friends, each week we are given the opportunity to join in building God's kingdom in our world. And we are grateful for the many ways that you continue to support the life and ministry of our church through your gifts and your offerings. Each week we invite you to send those checks to the church office or to give through Venmo or through our website. And as you do that, you join with God's people everywhere in sharing God's love and sharing the good news of his kingdom. So let us come this morning before God, bringing our tithes and our offerings.
Pray together. Gracious God, we rejoice that you call each one of us. You call us by name. You call us your children. And you call us to be disciples, to join in building your kingdom. We thank you for the many opportunities we have to share our gifts and resources with others. And we pray this day that you would take these gifts, take them and bless them, use them, so that others might come to know of your grace and love in their lives. For we pray this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. Each week we have the opportunity to come before God with our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. And we invite you to share your personal re prayer requests with us. You can email us at pray at brpc.org and we will include those prayers in our upcoming worship services. Let us come before God now with our prayers for the people. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we rejoice that you came into our world, that you dwell among us. We rejoice that your presence is known to us in our daily lives, that we feel and see and sense your presence around us. We thank you for the gift of friends and family, those who care for us and those for whom we care. We thank you for the many examples of your love and grace that we see each day and the ways that in turn you call us to minister to others, to share our gifts and resources with others ways that we are called into ministry together as a body of your people. We thank you, Lord, for the ways that we can bring hope into our world, light into the darkness, ways that we can speak words of truth, honesty, ways that we can make a difference in our daily lives to bring healing, comfort, compassion to others. Lord, hear us as we pray today for those on our hearts and minds. We pray for those known to us who are in need of your healing grace and comfort. We pray for continued healing for Gary Ingram, Don Reckenbeal, Richard Skidmore, John Smith. We pray for patience and healing and endurance for Ken Warman, Dan Boston, Dick Freiling, Beverly Prohaska. Lord, for these and the many others known to us who are struggling with ill health, we pray that your comfort and blessings would be upon them and those who care for them. Lord, we bring before you this day those who have lost loved ones in recent days or weeks. We especially pray today for Wanda and Paul Jenkins, on the recent death of their son, Gary. Lord, in the midst of their pain, we pray that your promises would bring comfort and hope, surround them with your grace. Lord, we continue to pray for our leaders, those in positions of power. May they use that power wisely. May the decisions that they make bring healing to our communities, life, May it bring hope to those who need it most. We pray for places in our world that make the news on a regular basis, places where there's poverty or war or disease. We pray, Lord, for peacekeepers, missionaries, those who work in faraway places, hoping to make a difference, hoping to be a beacon of light and hope in those places of darkness. We pray for men and women of our armed forces 
all over the world. We ask that you watch over them and their families, keep them from harm, protect them. Lord, we pray for peace, peace in our hearts, in our homes, in our nation, and in our world. A peace, Lord, that seems so hard for us to attain, but a peace that we know is not beyond your power. Help us, Lord. Restore us to be the people you call us to be and need us to be in our world so that we might be bearers of the good news. For we pray and ask this in the name of Christ, who taught us to say together when we prayed, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And please join me in singing our closing hymn, hymn number 333, God of the Ages, whose almighty hand. forth now from this service of worship with joy and with peace. 
And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and be upon you this day and forevermore. Thanks be to God. Amen.